Hi. Hi. So hi everybody. I'm uh, Axel Avril. I'm working at Fortinet. I'm their um, mobile malware uh, analyst. So just in case you don't know what that means, it means just I just get an awful lot of uh, mobile malware every day to analyze and to disassemble and uh, hopefully to understand what they're doing and detect afterwards, of course. Um, I'm not going to lecture you really about mobile malware on, on Android or, and all that stuff. It will be a very short introduction of, you know, what's the importance of uh, mobile malware today. Um, I think that probably all of you uh, have heard that really it's growing very fast on uh, Android. Um, I've got this nice chart there showing a peak for Android with, uh, with regards to other platforms. Um, to be honest, it's been nearly over one year, one year and a half, that people have been claiming that Android is really uh, full of malware. Actually, it's shorter than that. We saw uh, the peak arriving only like six months or at most one year ago. And before that, we still had an awful lot of mobile malware on Symbian, the Symbian platform. Because what people tend to forget is that there's uh, maybe perhaps even now, uh, now much more Symbian phones uh, in the world than Android platforms. So um, this is the kind of mobile malware that we get. Those are only recent ones, those that I got in, um, well, it's since the middle of uh, September, we get a lot of um, toll fraud, SMS toll fraud. Th those are mobile malware that are sending SMS to premium phone numbers. And, well, they get some kind of substantial re revenue from, from that. And the other kind of malware that we see pretty much is also spyware. And those are going to, I don't know, for one reason or another, um, spy your SMS messages, spy your locations, spy your call logs, who call themselves browsing, lo browsing logs, things like that. Um, if at one time you want to check what are the recent uh, mobile malware that we're catching, well, you can go to the URL down there and you'll have, you know, the, the recent entries, very recent entries. Also, the, the other thing that uh, we're seeing is that, well, since there has been kind of a growth on Android, Android malware there, well, now we can, we can see even some hits, some uh, uh, the, the kind of the infection rate, which is the download hits that we have for, for those malware on Android. And we see that, well, we're getting some, uh, some a, lot, a lot of hits for a few uh, samples, such as Droid Dream, for instance, on, on Android. And something like, well, the charts show something like in between 100 hits per month. Uh, the fact is that this is only the hits that we get through R40 gates. So, well, uh, people who don't have 40 gates don't get any hits, of course, and only when the stats are enabled on the boxes. So it's pretty much uh, underestimated there, of course. It still means that, you know, every month there are people, a lot of people, hundreds, which are trying either to download uh, a malware and probably install it afterwards, or getting infected one way or another. So that's all about what I'm really uh, uh, going to talk is more about, you know, uh, uh, more advanced stuff on um, Android reverse engineering. Um, I don't know if some of you were at, well, yes, I think so. Some of you were at Insomniac, uh, which is another security conference in uh, Geneva in March. And I talked about the kind of usual uh, tools that we are using when we want to reverse Android. Um, that is APK tool, um, Smalley, Box Smalley, those kind of tools. Um, you can download my slides there. Today I'm going to, um, to deal with some kind of uh, new stuff, that things a little bit more advanced that I think some of those you haven't seen uh, yet outside in, a, in the well. So a little bit on the compilers. And also we'll be playing pretty much uh, with the text format. <laughs> Already discouraged. Uh, <laughs> then I'll be doing a, a short demo and also uh, explaining a few stuff on how to evade 
um, emulator detection uh, when you're uh, a malware or when you're challenged, that, that kind of stuff. So the decompilers. Um, we've got, uh, I'd say, four main decompilers in, uh, that we can use. Two of them are not specific to Delvic. They're specific to Java, that is Java decompiler and DJ. And we've got some others, Dead and Dad, very similar names, which are kind of specific for Delvic. But all, all those four can be usable on uh, Android malware uh, to decompile and get some uh, uh, handsome uh, code to, to look at. So what I wanted to do here is I, I took um, a malware, recent malware, and with FakeMark, which was really, um, uh, which was out like one month or a little bit more in France, and it was specifically specifically uh, targeting France. So that's why we had a specific look on it because I'm based in France. Um, and I asked all those four decompilers to decompile a pretty standard, not really so tricky function, get key code there, and we'll have the, a look at the differences. So this is what Java decompiler would, will output. Um, I think it's quite okay the way it looks like. Um, the only thing which is a bit surprising is the while true loop loop that you have at the beginning at the top there. Don't really know why that that is. Uh, it's there. It's a bit strange. And of course there are a few issues that I can't mention there. But uh, I mean that I can't show on the slide is that Java decompiler uh, is prone to crashing. So there are a lot of uh, functions that I will say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't decompile, decompile it, I haven't managed to. So sometimes you have to fall back to another decompiler. DJ decompiler, so it's the same function, exactly. Same one. Uh, looks like um, it's a bit different. I find this perhaps a little bit more ugly because you've got a lot of go-tos, which is not very nice for Java programming. And also you've got the strange uh, instruction at the beginning, uh, beginning monitor enter. Uh, that is because uh, this is a Java decompiler and doesn't know the specifics of Delvic. So didn't uh, spot that one. With dead, uh, well dead, uh, I can't show you what it gave out because it crashed on that function. So there's got just, uh, I decompiled another function there, another one, the second, uh, second part. And it's okay, except that you've got a lot of casts, as you can see, object, object, R6, given, and um, the variables are not named, so you've got R6 for the sixth register and things like that. So maybe not so good. And then that, that is um, included actually um, most of the time in Android, if some of you know that tool. And it gives also a pretty good output, except that it's a bit kind of lengthy because uh, everything has the full path of, uh, of the name of everything before it. So you'll have come to to boy world of goo full before the, the, the actual name of the function. So that's a bit uh, lengthy. And you've got also always and nearly uh, every function that it uh, decompiles the synchronized keyword which I don't know why it's there all the time. So um, the goal here is not to say that uh, one decompiler is actually better than the other one. It's more just to show you that there are really some specifics, there's some specific output that you'll have with one decompiler and not with another one. So that if you find something a bit strange when you decompile with one, um, you can know if it's just that it's always outputting that kind of stuff or if you have to fall back and try another one to, to see what really the code would look like, of course. So that's all for decompilers. Now, the DEX format. So DEX is Dalvik executables, right? And like all um, uh, formats, uh, file formats, well, it starts with, begins with um, a header, okay? You've got the header where you've got most of the things, and then you've got um, plenty of arrays. Arrays uh, which are full of indexes that will actually point to the last part of the file, the file format, which is the data section. So, let's say you write some code 
and with, I don't know, a hello world. Well, the hello world, the, the string itself will be in the data section, so down there on the, in the yellow box. And you'll have the string array that will reference that string and uh, provide an index for uh, everybody who's using that, uh, that string there. Um, if you have the name of a method, I don't know, uh, get my, uh, my ID or something like that, well, that also for Dalvik is a string. So you'll have it in the, um, uh, in the yellow box there, down there in the data section. And you'll have the string array reference that string. And you'll have, as it's a method, you'll have the method array reference the string, uh, the string uh, index in the string array. Okay, so it's all a lot of, uh, a lot of indexes there to uh, not repeat strings and only have strings occur once in, uh, in, uh, in the format. Those are the main references that you'll have to look into if you want to start playing with the text format. Uh, when you'll have, of course, you'll have my slides, so you can uh, just click there and go to the the references. Um, so we have the text format, and we want most of the time what we want to do is have a look at the header first thing. So if you want to have a look at the header, there's one tool um, written by Tim Stratzeri, and it's not a very well known tool, but you'll find him on his, uh, on his blog, and it's called Dex Info. It's very simple. You just call Java Dex Info and provide the Dex file. It will read and output the, the header of the, of, the, of the Dex. If you don't want to do it that way, you've also got Androlize, which is part of AndroGuard, uh, with an intera interactive um, script shell there. And you can tell it, first thing, uh, load my classes.dex, so that's the first line of it. Then get the header out of um, that file, and then print it header.show. And you can uh, see what you've got in there. Like all um, header files, you've, it starts with uh, a magic. And the magic for uh, the, the dex uh, files is dex. And most of the time, I've seen 0.35. Actually, the, the specification says it can be a little bit uh, another number, too. but what we see is uh, 0 0.35 most of the time. If you want to parse a bit more than just um, the header, well, you can use uh, 010 editor, which is really uh, very handy there, because it will you, you load your dex file with also um, a dex template. And then it will show side by side one uh, the, um, the format, and then what's inside that particular part of the format. So it's really very uh, easy to, to parse text files with that. Then, if you want, there's a third way to, to play with text files is uh, with AndroGuard. Because AndroGuard has um, implemented um, just a set of tools, a set of, um, of classes to, to read each part of the text file. So you've got a class to um, to understand the header, that's called header item. You've got a class for the string, I the string array, string item, for the types, type, it type ID item, for, for everything, most of the time. And if you want to get one of those objects, one of those objects of those classes, well, you just um, call one of the, the methods that you've got, get header item, get field ID item. It's always the, ki the same kind of name that you've got there. And once you've got one of those objects, well, you've got most of the time always the same uh, names of uh, functions that you can use to, uh, to play, parse with, or show what's in, the, in, that, uh, in that object. So you can show it. That means it will show the disassembly of it, so the small code for it. You can also um, print the, um, uh, the hexadecimal bytes for that part. So that's get row for get row uh, for get the row buffer. You can also get its um, position in um, in the file. So that will be the, the offset gets the index, and you've got also, of course, some other shortcuts if uh, you just want to do something which is very uh, typical, such as uh, 
read all strings that are in the uh, in the dex file, well then you just call a function called get strings and it returns it all. Um, at first, uh, it seems perhaps a bit difficult to remain or to remember all the names of the functions. The very cool thing with it is that when you're using Android it's in an interactive shell, and you've got some completion for commands. So you just start and uh, write, type in the beginning of the command, and you'll have the rest of it uh, appear, um, which is very good. Those are just a few examples there. If you want to list all the classes, for instance, in a, in a DEX file, so it's get classes names, and you've got them all. If you want to get all methods, well, you this time you just do a very very short Python uh, command where you get all the methods for a given method, and then show all, all that uh, all, all that you have for that method. So yeah, that's all for for that part. Um, so now we're going to see kind of a use case. A few Months ago, um, Dex Labs released a challenge, uh, which was really interesting there, and it concerns uh, obfuscating bytecode. What they were doing there is that actually they were hiding uh, the real payload of, um, well, the, the real code of, uh, of the challenge inside something that would look like the payload of an, of, of an array. Okay, so in that um, right part, the dark brown part. So if you were just disassembling the code uh, instruction by instruction, you would see first a go to, and you'd say, okay, it's just a go to. Then you'd see the fill array data instruction, and you'd say, oh, I'm going to have a, an array. And then you'd read the other instructions within there, which are the payload. You would read them as the payload as the, the contents of the array and not as real instructions, uh, uh, Dalvik instructions. On the contrary, so let me get to the next one. Yeah, on the contrary, if you uh, disassemble and be a little bit more intelligent at the way you're disassembling and you see that the first go-to is always going to occur. So here, here what happens is that it tells you if a variable v0 equals v v0, Okay, that is always going to happen. We are going to skip nine words later, plus nine, and it's in words. So we're going to skip 18 bytes later, and that just happens to fall at the beginning of the payload of the supposedly uh, uh, data array. And then you will read the subsequent data as real David instructions and not just as a payload of an array there. So the way um, uh, the, um, the official way the challenge was solved there was uh, to with uh, using Androguard was to say okay we're gonna have it uh, have the disassembler point to the beginning of the payload and we're gonna tell it uh, well to have a look at this um, specific index so the method is called set code index and we tell it to go. 18 bytes later, 18 bytes later, and it will start and disassemble at that port. And that way we could see, well, the real uh, Dalvik code, so it's uh, starting to build uh, strings, and uh, then it will get uh, the application context. So that's a nice solution, and it worked, but actually um, set code index was written to specifically to, to solve the challenge, and uh, I think it wasn't really, uh, uh, it wasn't necessary. We could, it, it is possible to uh, solve the challenge without this uh, specific function. And I'm going to show you how. And it is also um, possible with uh, my solution to actually disassemble in a DEX file at any offset. You choose the offset and it will disassemble that part. Of course, if you choose an offset that is not meaning, uh, meaningful, well, of course, you're just going to disassemble crap. But if you, if you want, you can just put it at, at uh, the exact uh, points that you wish to disassemble. So this is the other way to do it. Um, basically, in that case, what we wanted to do is and that's right, is to disassemble at the offset, which is uh, the beginning of the um, 
brown box at the bottom there. But when we are in a method, the beginning of the method uh, is contained within a structure which is called a code item. And at the beginning, you've got plenty of um, fixed of variables there that um, hold the register size, the size for the inputs, for the outputs, plenty of other stuff. And all of that take 16 bytes. Okay, so we're going to have to pass by. We can get the location of the beginning of code item, that is the code offset. Then we've got to skip 16 bytes. And then we have to skip again nine words, that is 18 bytes again. So 16 plus 18. And then what, what I have done is uh, actually um, write um, a tool for Android Guard, which is just a Python uh, helper, uh, helper script that will disassemble at any offset that I give uh, in, uh, for, for the DEX file. Um, Android Guard is open source, uh, so I will, uh, I, I will send out my, uh, my script to them so that they include it in, uh, in uh, the repository. So, time to wake up, as I said, and it's demo time. Um, There we go, with ni a nice big font so that everybody can read, hopefully. Is it okay? So, what, I, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you exactly that part live, and I'm going to launch Android Guard. There it goes. And um, Crack Me Obfuscator is uh, the, the Dex Labs challenge. Okay, so I don't remember exactly the name. There we go. I can use completion. Analyze APK. Crack me of the skater. And I just specify also which decompiler I want it to use if I wish to, to use a decompiler. Analyze APK, APK outputs uh, three, three different outputs, which will go in the variables A, D, and DX. Then I can do plenty of things with that, and it's quite interesting. For instance, I can show you which is the main activity of the challenge. Okay, it's the drop activity. I can show also, I don't know, the permissions. What is it uh, doing? Oh, okay, it's using the internet uh, permission. So, that's just part of the cool thing that we can do. Now we're going to have a look at, more specifically, um, well, the, the activity that we're concerned with. So we said it was drop activity. And we can s inspect all the methods that we have there. So, the one I'm really interested in is called exec. And we're going to try and show it. So, no, it's not an error there, it's really, yeah, there we go. So we have there exactly what we are decompiling, and we see that we have a fill array data, and then the fill array uh, payload, and it doesn't look very much like that. And we've got the go-to exception, the go-to instruction, sorry which is down there at the bottom. If we try to, do, to use the decompiler, it's not going to work because, of course, it doesn't understand very much out of that data payload, so we get an error. Now, if we do it the official way, we set the code IDX, and we say it's 12, and we do that again. And yeah, okay, so that, then it works, and we see the decompiled code, and it's really much more readable there. And if you want to have a look at it in Smiley, there it is, and it is also completely different. There you've got the the strings that we're building at the beginning, 
here again, then getting uh, the application context, all that stuff. So now I'll do it my way. So I have to reset it so that I'm not cheating. Set it back to IDX0. And um, as this is a bit lengthy, I'm going to rename it exec method and say that like that. <coughs> exec method. Now I need to get the offset of the beginning of my Methods, so um, I think it's get off. Get. No. Right, it's get code off. Sorry. So what's the the offset for? That two hundred and nineteen nine hundred. Okay, so and I need to get also the length um, of um, the code block that we have to see how much we're gonna decompile. So get code, get in size. So that's the size of the instructions that we have, and we have one hundred and eight uh, bytes there. Now, I'm going to decompile, decompile it. First, I uh, need to get the dex file. I had to analyze an APK, so what's the, the dex? So the dex is I get, A get dex. And then in my dex, I have the row buffer for the dex file inside that APK. Okay? And I use decodes, DCM, the length is 108 minus 9 because we said we're skipping 9 words then my dex and I tell it where to read so it's 209 900 plus I said we're skipping 16 bytes the 16 bytes for the registers the input size and everything and then 18 bytes because uh, that's um, where we are pointing to for the beginning of the array and this is just a random uh, stuff where to, to, to stop reading. And, oops, we're going to show the result of this. And there it goes. You can see, again, decompile it. Fine, we've got the string, st uh, building the string. Uh, getting the application context, all that stuff. So that's the way to do it with Android Guard without my script. And if you want to do it a little bit more quickly with the script, so self Android Guard, and I called it Android Dis for this assembly. You got a very quick helper for the um, usage. So input is the dex file. So the dex file is in that directory. Mm, yep, it's in there. And the offset, so it's 219900 plus 16 plus 18, so that's plus 34. And there we go. Okay, string builder again, you recognize the, the real output there. Okay, so that's all for the demo. Back to the, um, to the slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was in case the demo did not work. You see, uh, I've got the back of slides. Um, so now we, we saw how to play with the dex file and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, if we have played and modified a dex file, uh, it's not going to work straight away afterwards because there is in the header um, a checksum and a hash for the dex. Okay? So if you want it to be acceptable afterwards for the Android platform, well, you have to re-checksum and to rehash. 
So I've written this very small tool that is on uh, GitHub there if you want to, to have a look at it, but it's really nothing uh, extraordinary. It's just rehashing, recheck, and checksumming the, the DEX file, but it's handy in those cases there. When you've rehashed it, then if you want to repackage the APK, it's also very simple. You just get, you really need to get all the ingredients. So you get the modified classes.dex, and you, you also get everything, all the other things that you need, which is the assets, uh, the resources, the Android manifest. You zip all of that, and then you do uh, a dry sign on that. It's quite um, simple to do it with, uh, with a make file, actually. Um, on a totally different uh, aspect, um, sometimes also we, uh, when, you're, when we're analyzing uh, malware or doing things like that, it's useful to know our device ID. So if you want to know your device ID, the, the easiest way to do this is write a simple application and uh, ask for what Android calls Android underscore ID and just display it. That's one of the easiest ways. If you're not into uh, application writing and you don't want to, to do that, the other way to do it is you get a shell on, uh, on your device and then you uh, go into uh, a database that is called settings and look for the secure table in there and there's also a field called android underscore id and you can either read uh, the value for that there and if you're root you can also modify it. Now some other interesting stuff I think is um, evading emulator detection. Because we have, of course, well, uh, sometimes malware that don't want us to be uh, uh, to to be looked into from a, from an emulator, and they'll behave totally differently on the emulator than on a real device. But on the other hand, well, from an analyst point of view, it's very cool to be using an emulator because, well, you know, the devices just don't always uh, happen to to work uh, the way you expect expect them to. So. Um, how do they detect the emulator? Most of the time they do it by checking for system properties and they look for the expected values that all Android emulators will return. Uh, for instance, uh, they will say that the product name is SDK, that the product brand is generic and all that stuff. So they'll check for that and if it has the, the specific value for the emulator, well then it'd say, oh, sorry, this is an emulator, I'm going to do this or that instead of my normal behavior. Um, they can do that on a coding uh, implementation uh, point of view, either by calling the get prop command, uh, that's from the shell, or uh, from uh, the, uh, um, a method called get in the system properties uh, class. So this is um, uh, a crack me that was uh, out from, uh, again, Tim Stratzeri there and as you can see it is detecting that it's running on an emu emulator and as I wanted to solve the challenge and I wanted to do it uh, completely I said oh, I'm gonna work out that it doesn't detect it's on the emulator so we saw that it's just uh, checking for the the properties there so what are we going to do well we have to understand how the properties are being returned so from an architecture point of view if you get the properties, you've got two entry points. Either you get, you're get you getting it from get prop, which is the shell command, so this is on the right uh, side of the, of the slide, and then it will go into, uh, that is implemented actually in the toolbox part of it, and in the end it goes down to libc utils. If you're using um, uh, system properties uh, .get from uh, the uh, the Dalvik framework, uh, the uh, the virtual machines, then it is going to Android system properties, then to um, GNI part of that, and then relying at the bottom, again, on libsite utils. So, of course, what we're going to do is we're going to hook um, the get properties function at libsite utils level. Okay, and whenever somebody is asking for, I don't know, a row product brands, we're not going to return generic, but either something real that you fancy or 
or whatever name, anything that's uh, actually the challenge or the malware is not going to recognize as, uh, as something, a part of the emulator. Um, it's not actually going to work if you hook all system properties at libc-utils. There is one property, row, kernel, qmu, that you cannot hook at libc-utils levels, because if you do, the emulator is not going to boot at all. So this one, you've got to hook it a little bit, at just a layer above, at the GNI level. And once you've done that, well, once you've done that, well, what you have to do is, of course, you recompile your emulator, and then it works. It's not detecting, uh, it's uh, running on the emulator. Last part, also, we're very much concerned with uh, when we're uh, analyzing mobile malware is, of course, SMS. We want to, be, to, to know what the phone is going to send as SMS, what it's going to receive, all that kind of stuff. So uh, on the SMS language, well, the cell phone is always communicating with what we call an SMS center, SMSC. If we're using... Uh, uh, an Android emulator. Well, what happens is that we can very easily uh, read what uh, the emulator is sending as SMS by just having a look at the radio logs. Okay, so this is the command command adb logcat uh, slash b uh, radio, and we can read uh, what's going out there. We see the SMS uh, in PDU format. If we want to send an SMS to uh, the Android emulator, then we use Telnet, and it will send it to, uh, to the emulator. So that's helpful. That's, that works. That's just what it looks like if you want to have a look at the, the PDU. That's the PDU of, um, uh, of an SMS. We can also use some, um, some other um, libraries. Uh, we've got a Python messaging library that will uh, help you uh, encode um, uh, from the Android emulator's perspective uh, PDUs. So it will encode SMS submits and decode uh, the deliver part. So that's what, you, what it look, uh, looks like if you want to, uh, um, to, to send an SMS from uh, the Python language with that part. But actually, it's not very helpful in our case, well, for, for a mobile malware analyst, because what we really want to do is not to encode an SMS submit, but we want to decode it. And the other way around, for the SMS deliver, we want to encode it. And those parts are not included in Python messaging. So if we want to decode uh, the PDUs, for instance, what we can do is use another tool, which is called PDU Spy. Um, this is a Windows tool, but uh, if you're just a Linux addict or a Unix addict, it also works in, uh, uh, with Wine. So. And it will uh, decode the, the PDU and show you the phone number, well, all the details that are included in the, in the SMS. The phone number and, of course, the body of, uh, of the SMS. Or you can use, of course, an online decoder that works too. There are a few, a couple of there out on the web. Okay, that's about all. Um, I just uh, wish to mention, of course, that um, uh, I've designed uh, an Android challenge. Uh, it's still uh, out and running, of course. And, well, if you're the first one to find the solution and bring it to Fortinet's booth, which is over there, uh, well, you'll be hopefully lucky to, wi to win uh, a Fortigate. Um, the, ha the, the challenge is downloadable from uh, the Hashdays website if you, if you want there. And hopefully things that I've said there will perhaps help you solve it or not, or I hope anyway you'll have had a, a good time looking at the challenge and listening to the talk. And this is all well, my details if uh, you want to contact me uh, later for this stuff or others. Um, I think we perhaps have time a little bit for questions, if uh, some people have questions.